morning. Welcome to worship. How's everybody doing this morning? You good? Had a beautiful 60 degree weather yesterday and snow this morning. Isn't that beautiful? Jersey weather. Well, I'm glad that you all ventured out this morning on a nice cold winter day. Thank you guys for joining us at home. Welcome this morning. I don't know kind of what brought you in the door this morning. Um, what kind of maybe week you've had down throughout the course of the week. But I know for me this morning, I know coming here and being around God's people and being in God's house, and I know one thing for sure. I know that this morning I need to encounter Jesus afresh and new. I know that this morning I need just a special touch from Him that's going to fill me throughout the course of the week that I can love people the way that he wants me to love them, that I can care for people, that I can, I can be the person that he longs for me to be down throughout this next week. Because I'm tired. You guys tired? Yeah? Yeah? So this morning, I hope and pray that you've come for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to encounter Christ afresh and new. And so I'm wondering if you'd be willing to join me in just bowing our heads and closing our eyes for just a moment. And I want us just to take a deep breath. Because what I want us to do in that breath is I want us to let go of all expectations. I want us to let go of all of our past week. I want to take a minute and I want us to let go of all of this upcoming week our thoughts, concerns, and worries about it. I want us to have one simple prayer this morning. Jesus, I want to meet with you. God, I want to meet with you today. So Jesus, would you help me? God, would you have your way in our hearts and our minds? Would you have your way in this service this morning? Would you fill us afresh and anew? God, so that you may pour us out the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship together. Good morning, church. There's an invitation for us today to worship God the way we were created to. And I invite you to come with us as we sing. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait.
remains is that God is still answering prayer. God is still moving and God the God that we serve is still a God that encounters people and that's our prayer today our prayer today for you is not that God would fix your circumstances or change your situation but that you would have a genuine encounter with him today so let's choose that today yes I will I can one the same God
we're truly a blessed people, aren't we? You know, each of these balls in here represent a story, right? And sometimes in the lowest of valleys, what? I will do what? I will trust in who, in who he is in my life. Not in the circumstances, but in who he is in my life and his willingness to walk with me and journey with me and carry me through no matter what I may face. I'm never alone. Let's worship him and celebrate him this morning. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Chicago Fire in the 1800s, I believe it was 1871, and not shortly after he lost everything material as far as financial, all his investments, all the things that had made him successful, he lost it. Shortly around that same time, he had lost his only son, he had five kids, one, one son, he lost him to scarlet fever. So think about this now you have a man who has been successful who loses everything and then right around the same time loses his son so thinking that maybe it was time for a little bit of a break a little bit of a reprieve he sends his wife and four daughters on a ship across the sea to go to England just to get away and he stayed back just to tie up some loose ends and had planned on meeting all of them in England and then on this journey that his wife and four daughters were on the ship sinks and the only survivor was his wife so now he's lost five kids everything everything he owned and all that's left now is him and his wife who's across the globe so now he sets sail because he now wants to go meet up with his wife and right about the location you see this shipwreck was well known at the time and the captain of the ship that the writer of this song was on knew that he was on the ship and right, right around where the ship that his daughters uh, were sunk the ship that sunk and his daughters died on the, sh the captain of the ship told him hey this is kind of where it happened and 
it's at that place and from that point moving forward where the words of this song came to be it did not come up from a place of prosperity or having life together you see a lot of us can connect to where he was at this time maybe not having lost children but maybe what are you going through today that feels like it what's the heavy burden that we're weigh is weighing on you today or on us collectively you see the reason why we can choose to worship in spite of what is going on in our lives is not because our situations are where we want them it's because of the God that we serve who is in control of that. And we say it a lot, but I don't know that we say it enough, is that God is not interested in our circumstances and changing them. He's interested in changing us in the midst of them and offering us the one thing he knows that we need. We have an idea of what we want, but he knows what we need, and what we need desperately is his presence and more of it. So we can sing confidently this next song it is well in spite of what I'm going through because the God that I serve has offered me his presence and no matter what happens around me I will be okay I will be okay so maybe you connect to that today and when we sing this song in worship my prayer for you is that you would connect somewhere and that God would encounter you in your situation through this song, not to make your situation better, but to, to grow you and to transform you in the midst of it.
my sin. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. Not just a little bit of it, not just a piece of it. All of it is nailed to the cross. And we don't have to bear it anymore. Praise God this morning. Praise God this morning. As we enter into our prayer time, as is our tradition here at Rama, this is a time for all of us to participate. And I just sense an overwhelming need to praise him today. Just to praise him. What is that word for you today? The songwriter said it's bliss. It's glorious. What's that word that is just bubbling up inside of you today that describes your encounter with God this morning? And maybe you're sitting there and you're saying, I, I, don't, I, I don't have... I'm not experiencing that. That's okay. That's okay. Confess what it is that you carried in and tell Jesus about it. What's that word today? What are you feeling that's getting in the way of that encounter? I feel fear this morning. I feel anxiety. I needed to take that deep breath and just become aware of myself. What's your word this morning? No matter what it is, will you confess it to him today? The floor is yours. Grateful. Loved. Humbled. We sense your presence, God. Thankfulness grace. Mm. The amazing peace that is beyond our understanding. Wonder. Eternity. My best friend. Unconditional love. Identity. Freedom. Peaceful. Forgiving. Security. Strength. Hope. joy grateful Lord Jesus We're so grateful this morning that you don't grow weary and you don't change. You are an everlasting God. Lord, we thank you this morning that whether it's peace like a river or sorrow like a sea billow that we're experiencing right now, as we've been reminded many times this morning, it's not about our circumstances. Because whatever our lot, you've taught us to choose to say that it is well. I thank you, Lord, that we can be honest 
with you and with ourselves and, and just say, I'm, I'm not experiencing joy right now in my circumstances, but God, I'm experiencing your joy in my spirit. Lord, thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord. Thank you for an opportunity to share our praises with you today. Lord, for the opportunity to choose to praise no matter what we might be feeling. Lord, we need you. We need you. Whether we're on the mountaintop or we're in the valley, we need you. And Lord, we humble ourselves and come before you now, asking that you will meet us where we are. Open our hearts, open our minds what you want to say to us today, how you want to encounter us. Lord, help us to let go of whatever we were expecting. And not to think, well, I'm only going to encounter him the way I have before. Lord, encounter us afresh and anew today. Remind us once again that you are our everlasting and it's in your name we pray. Amen. At this time, we're going to invite you to the front to bring your tithes and gifts and offerings if you choose. And if you're at home and would like to give, you can do that online at ravothchurch.com or on the church's app. Feel free to come as we continue to play.
bunch of other people of like hearts and minds and we join together in worshiping our God and our Lord and our Savior and he is great right he is and sometimes unfortunately it takes us to go through difficult things to us to really get a hold of that just how great he really is because if he's only the God of the mountain then not a very good God but our God is the God of the valley and the God of the no matter where we find ourselves, he's right there with us. Well, I got a little bit of information I need to share with you this morning. Uh, we need to do this for um, the purposes of being an organization. Uh, we have our all-church meeting coming up on March the 6th. Um, it is right after morning worship service, which will, bear, will be our board elections. Uh, we have tried to send out information to all of the voting members to make sure that you're getting the nominating people who have accepted their nominations and that will all be on March the 6th following the morning worship service right around 11:30 so I just need to make sure that I'm putting that information out to you so that you're aware of that okay if you have questions please get a hold of one of us uh, staff members and we will try to fill in the blanks to make sure that you understand what's going on as a church, one of the things I love about our church uh, for me is this, is that we journey with people. We walk with people. And sometimes journeying with people means that we walk with them through the valleys of their life, and sometimes life is pretty difficult. And what we try to do as a church is we try to make sure that no one is alone in their time of need and that we rally around you and try to support you and try to help you but also another point about our church is that we also celebrate with people and their accomplishments. So it's not just we walk with you in the valley. We want to be with you on the mountain type. And we want to celebrate you and lift you. And we want to honor you. See, to me, church is about people. That's what church is. It's about relationships. Ministry is relational. That's all that ministry is. And for me, I love not only that I get to journey with you in your troubles, but I love when I get to celebrate you on your mountains. And boy, do I have a celebration this morning. Woo. I just love people. And when they are accomplishing great things in life, man, I just bubble over with joy. And there's someone this morning that I want to celebrate and I want to lift up. Because in my opinion, she is a phenomenal, phenomenal person. And she is a strong woman. She's an intelligent woman. Man, she is a woman that has passion and zeal and she's running after it and life kind of threw her a curveball see this young lady graduated and she had a degree and right at the time COVID happened and in essence the field of her degree kind of fell through the bottom and she walked through this period of time when there was no answers there was nothing but she stayed open and she kept praying and kept seeking God. And the next thing you know, she kind of got this idea and she started following this different path. Because God didn't quit. Although her field fell through, God had another plan for her. She just had to be open and stay curious. And of all the time in our world, you may think this is like the craziest thing in the world to do. She enlisted in the service. Right? Right? That almost sounds like that can't be God directing you there. God would not do that at this time and right. God would not do this to my daughter and to this young woman. So she goes and takes all these tests. 
And she's so unbelievably intelligent, she scores way up on the scale. And the service is like, what the what? She's not only enlisting in the service and going into the Air Force. And there is a special section in the service that they're getting ready to start. And it's all about the space, meaning the space. And she is in this brand new Air Force space program. Just kicking off. Just in case you thought, like, we aren't really that smart in South Jersey. Oh, we are. (laughs) I'm riding this girl's coattail. Because I know I'm not, but she is, and I'm going with her. Victoria Dar, come here. Now, I want you to know, this is Victoria's favorite thing to do is to come up front and stand with me. She loves being up in front of people and, wait, you want to wave then? No, you don't want to? Okay. She loves this. See, but here's the thing I want to say to you. I can't let her leave without praying for her. I know there's going to be difficulties waiting out there, but I believe in Victoria and I believe in the spirit of God that dwells within her. And this girl loves Jesus. And I am just, there will be no news that could come back about how far she goes up that would surprise me. She is a phenomenal, phenomenal young woman. And I want to celebrate her today. So, Victoria, if you'd let me, if you could stand here and face me, I want to anoint you. And mom and dad, you want to come on down? I know know your mom loves being up here too. This is her favorite thing. I think that may be kind of where you got it from. And I'm going to ask my staff to come and stand behind me and lay hands on me because I want to pray for this young woman. Mm, how excited I am. She is just unbelievable. You don't mind that I'm like really tooting your horn, do you? <laughs> That's okay. Mm. Lord Jesus, uh, What a privilege and an honor it has been for me, Lord, the pastor of this church, to watch this young woman grow up. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me a front row seat to watch her, Lord Jesus, go through all of her schooling, to go on to college and to succeed there and to strive and always wanting to be better. Thank you, Lord, for what you've created her to be, God. Thank you, Lord, for her salvation. Thank you today, God, Lord, that she believes what she believes, God. Lord, as she leaves us to go to basic training and then on, Lord, to the specialized training, God, would you go before her? Mm -hmm. Would you, Lord, shine the light of your holiness upon her pathway and may she walk in the light as you are in the light. Lord, may you bless her Lord, may you let her achieve things she never knew possible, God. Would you help her to rise to her created potential and be all that she was created to be? And God, may she have the time of her life, God. May she just enjoy you and enjoy her life. For, Lord, you have created her and you have ordained her. Bless her today, God. Bless her, Lord. Keep her. Be, Lord, with mom and dad as she goes away, Lord. Bless them. For, Lord, there's not going to be a lot of contact for a while. So, Lord, bless them. Thank you, Lord, for Ed and Michelle and their life. Lord, for their children. God, what a blessing this is today. I pray this, Lord, in your name. Amen and amen. Amen. I love you. you. Mm, You're welcome. Congratulations, buddy. I love you. See, to me, that's what church is. Church is about people. Woo. Man. Makes me want to preach longer today when I have stuff like that going on. And the church said? Okay, I was wondering. (laughs) You know, it is Super Bowl Sunday. I thought I may get a little, what? (laughs) Oh, goodness gracious. We've been walking through and we've been looking at this whole idea of which side of the, of the chasm are you on. And I think the thing that I'm trying to help you all with is 
we're all created to be on the right hand, yeah, the right hand side of the, if you were looking at it. But a lot of times we find ourselves on the left. And the one thing about us as human beings is we don't want to get hurt. We, we don't like pain. So when we feel pain, the most natural thing in our humanity is to self-protect and to cover up so we don't get hurt anymore. And that's why a lot of times you're going to find yourself, because you, you're not going to knowingly choose to run over the bridge and run back over on the left-hand side, but you're going to find yourself there. And that's when it counts. When you find yourself there, are you going to stay there? Or are you going to say to yourself, no, we're going to walk back across that bridge and I'm going to come over here and live in my createdness even though it scares me to death. And that's really what Christianity is about. It's about learning to keep walking back across the bridge no matter how many times I find myself on the left-hand side. That's what Christianity means. It's a struggle. Sometimes being a Christian is the most difficult thing in the world. It just is. We also have been looking at this idea of, of this whole thing with, with being with a group of people that help us stay on the right-hand side of that bridge. Sometimes we just struggle to be there. And you got to find good people that are going to constantly encourage you to get on the right-hand side of that bridge. No matter how difficult it is, they're going to walk with you. They're not going to give up on you. They're going to, they're going to encourage you. They're going to be your greatest fan base in the world because they know living on the left-hand side of the bridge just makes your problems worse. That's all it does. A lot of times the greatest pain in our life is not necessarily what happens to us, but it's how we respond to the pain in our life that makes our pain really really severe. So this morning, I want to encourage you. Make sure you have good, solid people around you that encourage you to be on the right-hand side of that bridge. And you see them, man, that guy is going back and forth, ain't he? Busy up there, right? That's what happens sometimes. Sometimes life is difficult, and you feel like all you're doing is going back and forth across the bridge. And I want you to know something this morning. That's okay. That's totally, completely okay. This is what we've kind of been looking at, is understanding ourselves as a trichotomy. Every single one of us have a human spirit, a soul, which is really the seat of your personality, and then your body is how you live your life out. And the reality is, is the Holy Spirit, which is the dove, he speaks to our human spirit, and our human spirit speaks to our soul, and then our soul decides how we're going to live this out in our body. That's kind of the idea we've been looking at. And that's what I've been trying to help you with, is to understand who we are as people created in the image and the likeness of God. So I'd like to kind of take a look today at the Gospel of John chapter 4. And I'd like to talk to you about this idea of worship and the idea of being in communion with God. Because that's really one of the aspects of our human spirit is we commune with God. And in John chapter 4, uh, Jesus here is, the picture was becoming clear to the Pharisees. They're the religious leaders that didn't like Jesus. That Jesus had gained a following much longer, larger than that of John the Baptist. Now John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He was preparing the way for Jesus the Messiah to come. And he had a big following and Jesus' following is even bigger than that. They called him the wandering prophet. Now how he, Jesus, could see that the Pharisees were, were beginning to plot against him. So he knew the Pharisees were having a problem. So Jesus has this idea. This was because his disciples were busy ritually cleansing many new disciples through baptism. So his disciples, Jesus' disciples, were baptizing people. And more and more people were coming to follow Jesus, is what the scripture is telling us. So Jesus chose to leave Judea, where most Pharisees lived, and return to a safer location in Galilee. This was a trip that would take them through Samaria. Now, this is where the problem begins. Because the Jews and the Samaritans have a big problem with each other. But Jesus is going to go through Samaria. Like, that's just like Jesus, right? He's not going to avoid the problem. 
Now, the hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans, just to give you some context here. So the Samaritans only believed in the first five books of the Bible. They didn't believe in the prophets, Psalms, the wisdom literature. They only believed in the first five books of the Bible. So they had an incomplete view of God. This is one of the things about the Samaritans. They worshiped on Mount Gerizim instead of the temple of Jerusalem. So all of the Jews... They went to Jerusalem for worship, but the Samaritans said that their forefathers created altars up on this mountain, and they worshiped on the mountain instead of going to Jerusalem. So all of a sudden, the Jews and the Samaritans start having problems between them. The Samaritans worshiped idols with Gentile nations on this mountain. So... Remember, for the Jews, if you get too close to a Gentile person, you're ceremonially unclean and you can't go to worship. Well, now the Samaritans, who are Jews, actually, and have stepped away from Judaism, are now living and worshiping with the Gentile people. The Samaritans intermarried with Gentile people. All Jews were instructed... They were only to marry other Jews because of worship practices. It really wasn't anything other than worship. Well, now the Samaritans are now marrying Gentiles. They're worshiping when Gentiles, and they're worshiping the idols of the Gentiles. So the Jewish people had this great idea. We're going to destroy the temple on Mount Gerizim. And in 128 before Christ, they went up and they destroyed the temple that was on the mountain. If you can't join them, you destroy them. It's kind of the, the idea here that's going on. The Samaritans were unclean people and the Jews must avoid them. So watch this. If Jesus is going to lead his disciples through Samaria, Jesus and his disciples would become unclean. That's in the Jewish mindset and the Jewish law, that's what they would believe. That's how that would look to them. But Jesus is going to now leave where, the, where all the Jews are and the Pharisees, and he's going to go through Samaria to get to Galilee. In a small Samaritan town known as Sychar, Jesus and his disciples stopped to rest at the historic well that Jacob gave his son, Joseph. So Jacob, one of the patriarchs, right, of the Jewish faith, had dug this well and built this well and, and dedicated it to his son, Joseph. It was about noon when Jesus found a spot to sit close to the well while the disciples ventured, ventured off to find provision. So the disciples are going into town to get food, and Jesus is sitting out by this well in Samaria, and he's just sitting there, but that's not really just all he's doing. From his, Jesus' vantage, he watched as a Samaritan woman approached to draw some water. So Early in the morning, the Jewish people would come and other people would come and they would get their water early in the morning. But see, women weren't allowed to come during that time because women in this culture cannot engage in social conversation with men. So they had to come at noon when no one else would come to the well because it was too hot. Unexpectedly, meaning he, Jesus, spoke to her. And Jesus said, would you draw water and give me a drink? This woman's like, what? I cannot believe that you, a Jew, would associate with me. A Samaritan woman, much less, asked me to give you a drink. Like Jesus violates the social customs of the day right there. He's not even allowed to speak to this woman in public. And she knows that much less he's a Jew and she's a Samaritan, which already does this. And she's a Samaritan who's a woman, which puts her down even here. I mean, culturally, this is like crazy what's going on at this well. See, Jews do not associate with Samaritans. They just don't do it. It doesn't exist in this culture and time. Jesus would become ceremonially unclean and therefore he could not participate and worship according to the Jewish law, but Jesus doesn't seem to be too worried about that. Hmm. 
Jesus is violating accepted social barriers by speaking to a woman in public. And to us, this kind of doesn't even make sense, right? We're like, okay, so what's the big deal? Oh, back then it was a big deal. A big deal. Verse 10, Jesus says, You don't know the gift of God or who is asking you for a drink of this water from Jacob's well. Because if you did, you would have asked him for something greater and he would have given you the living water. So this woman's at this well at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, hottest portion of the day. She's going to draw water and carry the jugs of water back to her family. And Jesus says to her, if, if you knew who I was, if you really knew me, you'd be asking me for water. I wouldn't be asking you for water. And I would give you living water. The woman says, sir, you sit by this deep well, a thirsty man without a bucket in sight. Where does this living water come from? She's totally and completely not understanding anything Jesus is saying. She's saying, if you have such great water and ability, then where's your bucket? You, that well is deep. You can't get this water. Are you claiming superiority to our father Jacob, one of the patriarchs of the faith? who labored long and hard to dig and maintain this well so that he could share clean water with his sons, grandchildren, and cattle? See, in her mind, Jacob, one of the forefathers of her faith and one of the forefathers of the Samaritan belief system, is one of the great patriarchs. So Jesus is claiming, in her mind, to be greater than Jacob, which immediately makes Jesus nothing spiritually in her mind. No one claims to be greater than Jacob. Nobody would do that. That's her belief. Jesus says, drink this water, this well water, and your thirst is quenched only for a moment. You must return to this well again and again. I offer water that will become a wellspring within you that gives life throughout eternity. You will never be thirsty again. Now, I just want you to kind of imagine you're this woman, and you're there every day at 12 o'clock to fill up this big, giant jug of water and carry it all the way back to your family. And Jesus is saying, hey, I want to let you know, I can offer you water, a wellspring that, would, that gives life throughout eternity, and you'll never be thirsty again. If she's never thirsty again, then that would mean she never has to come back and fill her jug up and carry it. See, literally is how she's taking what Jesus is saying. Please, sir, give me some of this water so I'll never be thirsty and never again have to make this trip to the well. See, literally she thinks Jesus is talking about well water and Jesus isn't talking about well water. Jesus is talking about water in a reference to eternal life. That's why he calls it living water. If you receive and drink living water, you would never thirst again, meaning your spirit would be satisfied. That's what Jesus is trying to say to her, but she's not getting the conversation. Then Jesus says to her, hey, then bring your husband to me. What? We're talking about well water. We're talking about water. What's a husband have to do with water? It, it's like all of a sudden Jesus goes totally left and it doesn't make any sense, right? Like, what do you mean, bring me your husband? We're talking about water. I'm, I'm filling this jug. You don't have a bucket. And you asked me out of the blue to, for me to bring you my husband. She says, I don't have a husband. What did Jesus bring it up for? Almost makes Jesus look a little silly, don't it? Technically, you are telling the truth. But you have had five husbands and are currently living with a man you're not married to. Hmm. What in the world does that have to do with living water? What in the world does this have to do with this conversation? Why in the world is Jesus going to talk about this in the midst of trying to tell her about this living water, this water that's in reference to salvation? Like, 
Where are we going with this? She says, sir, it is obvious to me that you are a prophet. Now, in this culture and time, one of the things that people believe about prophets is they speak on God's behalf and they know things through God's revelation. So all of a sudden, Jesus is no longer just any Jewish man. He's not just sitting there talking now. All of a sudden, because he was able to tell her this, all of a sudden now she realizes he at least is a prophet. That's what she comes to realization. For him to know what he knows about me and the men in my life, he's got to be a prophet. So Jesus wasn't trying to say something about her and these men to to berate her, to condemn her, to say she's this terrible, awful woman because she's been with five men, right? Are you with me? Because a lot of people think right here what Jesus is doing, Jesus is condemning her. Jesus is not condemning her. Not at all. Maybe what he's doing, hmm, maybe he realizes how difficult it is to find a good man. See, that was a joke and some of you didn't want to get it. You're so trying to get here with me. Stay with me for a moment. Jesus isn't condemning this woman. Jesus is not speaking down to this woman. Jesus is not berating her because she's been with five husbands. That's not what's going on here. Problem is, that's what most of us have been taught about this passage of Scripture. Not at all what's going on here. She says, hmm, you must be a prophet. Our fathers worshiped here on this mountain, but your people say, that Jerusalem is the only place for all to worship. Which is it? Now that she realizes he might be a prophet at least, she wants to now have a question, a conversation about worship. See, all of the Samaritans believe that on Mount Gerizim, that's where you worship because the patriarchs had built altars on this mountain. But the Jewish people believe the only place to worship is in Jerusalem. So what she wants to know from the prophet is, tell me, should I worship on the mountain or should I go to Jerusalem to worship in Jerusalem? I want to know where I should go because I need to go where I need to go. Because where you go to worship is so important to her because you got to go to the right place. You with me? Jesus says, believe me, dear woman, the time has come when you will worship the Father neither on a mountain nor in Jerusalem, but in your heart, which is a reference to your human spirit. Wait a minute. It's either the mountain or it's Jerusalem. What are you talking about now? I'm asking you a question because I want to go to the right place for worship. Jesus answers her by saying, it's neither. What? If it's neither, then where do I worship? Like, Jesus now is creating more questions than he's giving answers at this point. Jesus says, you Samaritans worship what you do not know, while we Jews, because Jesus is a Jew, Worship what we do know, for God's salvation is coming through the Jews. See, the reference here, once again, in culture is this. Because the Samaritans only read the first five books of the Bible, all the other information in the Bible they don't know about. So in reference, you're worshiping what you do not know because there's so much more about God for you to know, and you won't know it. You only limit yourself to the first five books of the Bible. That's what he's telling her. Although we Jews worship what we do know. Why? Because they accept the wholeness of the Bible that's presented at this time in culture. And then Jesus makes this phenomenal statement. Jesus says, for God's salvation is coming through the Jews. What's he talking about? Jesus is the Messiah. He's born a Jewish man. He's going to die on the cross for all these people and salvation will be offered through the Jews. This is what Jesus is trying to tell her. 
Do you understand that if Jesus would have never said anything about our five husbands, they'd never be having this conversation? He had to say something like that for her to see in him something that she couldn't see to get her to have the conversation he wants to have with her. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. There's no way for this woman to believe Jesus is a prophet without telling her something He shouldn't know about her. Hmm. Jesus says, it's who you are and the way you live that counts before God. See, the Jews and the Samaritans would go to their places of worship at different times in the day. And they would pray at different times in the day. So the place you go and the time you go for worship was of utmost importance. It's the only thing that mattered. At certain times in the day, you go to your place of worship and you pray. Everything was about the time and the place. Everything about worship was where you were and what time it was. Everything was about that. And Jesus says, "Uh, see... It's who you are and the way you live that counts before God. Which makes no sense to this woman. You worship, your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. Remember, truth in the Greek means reality. See, your worship must engage your human spirit. See, the Holy Spirit speaks to our human spirits. See, in order for we, us to be in worship, we must be engaging spirit to spirit. And what we're searching for in worship is truth, meaning reality. Not subjective truth, what I want to believe and what I want to hear. See, worship is all about, I worship God in spirit and in truth. And truth is about reality. And the reality that God showed this woman was that he knew all things about her. See, because when you worship and you encounter God, see, what we always get when we worship God and we encounter God, we see ourselves. The reality is about us. That's what we see. That's the kind of people the Father is out looking for those who are simply and honestly themselves before him in their worship. You know how many people I know that they struggle coming to church when they feel they've done something bad. Well, I, I don't feel I don't feel good. I, I I feel guilty like when you know I can't go to worship because you know I did this horrible thing this week or I'm struggling this week or I don't feel like I've done the things I should have done this week. So I can't go to worship. See, I I can't see, but worship is about the one thing. It's about offering myself to God. God is omniscient. It's a theological word for all-knowing. God already knows about Bill. I'm the one still learning about Bill. God already knows him. See, all he wants is me to come and present myself to him. No matter what myself is that day, no matter whether I'm struggling, whether I'm in a valley, or whether I'm on the top of the mountain, it doesn't matter. God is spirit, Jesus says. Those who worship him must do it out of their very being, their spirits, their true selves in this pursuit of truth. I don't know about for you, but for much of my life, Growing up in the church, when I was growing up in the church, I would come to church, and this is what I would do in church. I would come to church, and then after church, I would say, worship was good, I liked it, or worship wasn't good, I didn't like it. I liked the songs we sung, or what in the world, where did Brandon get them songs from today? Who did he Google? Like, are you kidding me? I like I like I like prayer time today. I really like prayer. Nah, I didn't like prayer time today. 
I really didn't like it. You know, and, and, and Pastor Bill's sermon, I mean, I just got to tell you, I don't know where he's getting this information from, but he's whacked. Like, what the world is going on here? See, and what happens is, growing up in my faith, I, in my soulishness, my soul is my mind, my emotions, and my will, would determine the goodness or the not-so-goodness of worship. If I liked it, if it said what I wanted to say, if it made me feel good, if I didn't feel condemned or convicted, if I didn't have to repent, if worship was kind of good, my soul said, that was great worship, and I liked it. But if worship wasn't something that made me feel good about myself, then you know what I said? That's the worst church service I've been to in my life. The problem is I was never meant to evaluate worship in my soul. Never meant to. I was meant to worship in my human spirit. See, his spirit speaks to my spirit. And then my spirit speaks to my soul. See, what I was doing, I was just coming to church all in my soulishness. And in my soulishness, in all of my glory, because you got to know just how wonderful I really was in my own mind. In all my glory, I evaluated worship in my mind and in my, in my feelings. And I determined the effectiveness of it based in what I personally thought. Talk about arrogance. Can't tell you how many times I walked out the door of church and on my way out the door, I'd be like, that was the stupidest service I've ever been to. That did nothing for me. Like, I don't feel any different after I left. You know, it's like, I don't feel any different. It's like everything was about my feelings, see, because I was all in my soul in reference to worship. Hmm. I'm wondering this morning, when you leave here today, how will you evaluate this service today? In your mind? In your emotions? Will you evaluate the service today in your soul? Or what, does, what did your spirit hear from the Lord today in worship. You know what the Lord said to me this morning in worship? He never grows weary. That's what he told my spirit. You know why? Because I'm in a situation in my life and it's pretty struggling right now for me. See, and God knew that. So God told my spirit, I never grow weary, Bill. I don't quit. I don't bail. See, that's what my spirit heard from God today. And then my spirit told my soul this morning in worship, hey, dude, guess what? He doesn't give up. It's what I needed. And see, God ministers to my spirit. What if today I was looking for an out? What if I wanted to get out of my situation I didn't want to be in anymore? What I didn't want to hear from God was he never gives up and he never quits. What I'd want to hear from God is, yo, let's cut and run. Now, see, my soul has to decide something. Am I staying with Jesus and never quitting and never running? Or am I out? See, that's what worship is. You want to know what worship is? Worship is a divine encounter between the Holy Spirit and your spirit, and then your spirit tells your soul, and then your soul gets to decide what you do with what God said. That's how we are created as human beings. I made a decision this morning standing on the back wall. I'm staying with Jesus. I didn't say I feel like it. My emotions right now do not feel like it. My emotions are tired. And there is a part of my soulishness that wants to say, I'm done. Jesus said, you can if you want, Willie. That's what you want to do, dude. That's your choice. You got free will, but I just want to let you know I'm not quitting. I'm not running. I'm not bailing. I'm inviting you to join me today. So for me today, it was two or three words out of a song that Brandon led us into. That's what Jesus used today to speak to me. So all the rest of the service, I guess I didn't need. No. Right? Because that's where we're going. Okay, if all you need was three words, what's the rest of the service for? Now watch. Since that moment, all the songs got richer. The prayer time got richer. And this sermon is banging. Like the preaching is unbelievable, you know? 
and then getting to talk about my girl, Victoria. This is like the bomb for me today. I'm just wondering today, what did the Holy Spirit say to your human spirit that your human spirit wants to tell your soul? See, if you don't find that out, I want to let you know something this morning. You're not in worship. Look what Jesus said. God is spirit. Spirit to spirit. That's worship. We're to worship God in spirit and in truth. Look at this. The Holy Spirit speaks to my human spirit, right? That's what's happening. That's the picture. That's the only way I knew how to let you see spirit. It's really not spirit, but it's the best I knew how to do. But watch this now. We worship God in our spirits. We don't worship God in our souls. It's not where worship encounters. It's our spirit. And the very first aspect of your human spirit is communion. It's all about communing with God, which means this. I commune with God in my spirit. And then my spirit tells my soul what the Holy Spirit said. And then my soul has to decide what we're going to do with it. Are we going to go with Jesus? Are we saying, no, 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 no. Nah, I don't want to go with Jesus. And once your soul makes that decision, then you live that out in your body. My decision today was I'm staying with Jesus in a situation that I'm really tired of and emotionally I kind of am done with. But Jesus said today, "Uh, no, no, uh, I ain't doing it. You want to be with me, Bill? Well, why you got to put it like that? You know, I want to be with you. Well, if you want to be with me, then you got to stay. There's no quitting. There's no running. There is none. See, because worship is where God reveals himself to us. God could have never told my soul that this morning. You know why? Because the emotions of my soul are hurt and they want to protect. So Jesus could have never communicated to my soul what he wanted to say. You know why? Because my emotional state of being would have been like, who cares? It's all about me. Man, but when he told my spirit, and my spirit so resonated with it, and my spirit told my soul, mm. see, and then what we do is in worship, we share ourselves with Jesus. That's what happened for me today. Just on the back wall, like the, you know, the lights didn't go out, the Shekinah glory of God didn't come down, the angels didn't, whoa, none of that. It was just little tiny inner voice in my human spirit that spoke. That's all it was. One moment. And if all I was listening and worship with was my human ears, I'd have missed it. See, worship is about the real me, the true me, and it's about intimacy. That's all worship is about. Offering myself to God with all of my glory. As you know, which ain't much. With all my problems and all my mistakes and all my struggles and all of myself, Jesus, here I am. You get all of me today. That's what worship is. The good, (laughs) for me the bad, and a lot of times the ugly. See, worship is all about the pursuit of truth. Because the one thing I have found out about worship, and that's this. Every time I encounter God, I see myself, the real me, sometimes the not so good me. And it's amazing to me, no matter what I've done and where I've been, what I don't feel from God is condemnation. I don't feel him busting in and like hitting me with a big ugly stick. What I always feel him saying is, hey, dude, hey, man, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this is really where you want to go with me. Come on, let's go. Because he knows if I don't, I go over on the left-hand side of that bridge, and I live in self-protection, and I eliminate myself from all of the great relationships I could have in the world. And Jesus has been here all morning. (laughs) There's no doubt in my mind. I'm just wondering. Today, which ears did you hear Jesus with? Did you hear Jesus with the ears of your soul? These ears? 
Or did you hear Jesus with the ear of your spirit? Did he whisper into the ear of your spirit? Or are you hearing everything through your ears, your physical ears? And when you rate the service today, are you rating it in your spirit or are you rating it in your soul? Because that's what every one of us do every time we leave this building. We rate Good, bad, right, wrong, I liked it, I didn't like it, I love this song, I didn't like this song, I didn't like, I didn't like Pastor Bill's shirt today, it bothered me, I didn't like Pastor Brandon's shirt today, that bothered me, I didn't like the way we did this, I, I wish we didn't do it. That's all it was. And my spiritual ears went, what? Bill, I don't give up. My love is unconditional. What did he whisper to the ear of your spirit today? Did you hear it? Or was in your soulishness, it was so loud you couldn't hear him today? Remember how Pastor Eddie started off the service this morning? He wanted us all to take a deep breath and let what? All of that soulishness that was going to get in the way of you hearing Jesus go. We just want to get rid of it. And the job of the enemy this morning in your life was to keep your soul as loud as he could so you can't hear the still, small voice of the Spirit. Pastor Phyllis? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we... uh We ask you, Lord, to forgive us if we've been living in our soulishness today. Help us to see ourselves. Lord God, we thank you for this message this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to encounter you. And Lord, as we go our separate ways today, I pray that you will remind us again. Help us to listen for that still small voice. Because, Lord, yes, you speak during worship services, but you speak to us all day long. Help us to hear you today. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Thank you for being with us today.